You want to intro this today? How do I want to intro this today? Yeah. How about the same way we've done it every freaking week? All right, you ready? I'm so ready. Welcome to Throwdown, guys. This is where we invite all of you. I'm just talking a little too fast. Hold on, don't I do that part too? <laughs> this is where we invite all of you to do a workout with our training think tank community. All right, Max, now say your part, looking like you're about to take a <laughs> high school photo, turn <laughs> sideways. <laughs> Each week, we do the workout a week before you so you can get a demo, some strategy, some kit. <laughs> some tips. Some tips. Just and some tips. 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 <laughs> T-I-P-S. And this week, fellas and ladies, Brandon did the workout. I did, I'm shaky still. And he still smells. And Max did the workout. He took a shower or something. I didn't shower, Good but I cleaned myself. He, he changed. All right, I did. roll that beautiful bean footage. Yeah! All right, let's go out to the training floor. Brandon will announce the workout. That I will. All right, the workout today is going to be four rounds for time, 20 shoulder overhead, 15 front squats, 20 box jump overs, 24-20. The weight is ascending for both the shoulder overhead and the front squats each round. So it's 135, 95, 55, 105, 75, 125, 205, and 145. If you need to scale the weights, take the heaviest load, put that at about 70%, and then kind of back off from there or just talk to one of your coaches, your coach or one of the coaches. You'll load your own weights for each round. So the first round, the weights will already be on the bar. You'll have your weights next to it. Once you get to the second round, then you'll add load by yourself. No one's helping you with that. The box jump overs, you can jump over lateral facing, forward facing. You can step off the box. You can jump over the box or you can land on the box. Doesn't matter as long as you get to the other side. Any questions on that? Any questions on the other movements? Yeah, yeah two foot takeoff. You have to jump on the box or over the box, but you can step down on the other side. No, no touching with your hands, no. Awesome, 22 minute cap. When's the first heat going, Max? Before we get to our demo with our athlete, Clay Godfrey, we wanted to remind you we have a scaled version of the workout in the description below, as well as a warm up and movement standard, so make sure you check that out. All right, so the primary thing with this workout that we wanted to discuss was pacing. Pacing is always a big concept in Metcons because you know if you fall off on the back half of the workout, you're just screwed. I mean, right. there's always that back half of the workout that ends up being the primary separator of the cream of the crop from and, everyone else. And I wanna kinda like, call, let's call this separation value. It's like, where can we gain time or lose time in workouts instead of just thinking like, oh, pacing, go slow at the beginning, go fast at the yeah. end. That's not what we mean. We're, we're saying, how can we separate, or how can you separate yourself to get a faster time in each round so that you yeah. have a total time that's yeah. faster than everyone Maximize else. your work speed, minimize your Correct. rest time. All right, so the three major concepts, I'll start with the first, is thinking of the four rounds as rounds one and two are really where you can be aggressive in this workout. The weights are light enough, you can cycle the bar fast enough. When we watch people in the workout though, they kept that aggression leading into round three and almost like emptied the tank. Yep. And then round four just ended up being like doubles on the shoulder to overhead. Yep. So. For most people, that yeah. 175 and the 125 bar got heavy enough where they, they could still go fast, but it started blowing them up. Yeah. So it's probably wiser to slow that down so that you can be more aggressive on the last bar because that's where, I mean, people got there with 10 minutes left and yeah. some people didn't finish because they were blown up so much. Yeah, so aggressive round one, aggressive round two, a little bit conservative in pace round three, and then empty the tank on round four. Yeah. Uh, second was... So, so one of the things that you can think about is how do I maximize my transition time? And in a workout like this where you're changing your own weight, that's an easy way to take a break from the box jumps, especially if you're bad at them, and also kind of kill two birds with one stone and add that weight on so you're yeah. not wasting time when you get back to the bar. So what I did when I did this workout, because my box jumps are not very efficient, is I would finish my front squats, go over to the box and try to do 10 fast, which they weren't that fast, but fast for me, and then I would immediately go over and change one side of, or add a 10 pound plate to one side, make sure I put the clamp on, go back over, do 10 more fast, and then to get my heart rate down from the box jumps because that's what spiked my heart rate the most, go and change the other side and then try to go immediately into my first set of shoulder overhead. Yeah, so you can use those weight changes as planned rest breaks because you gotta get that work done. Right. Like you gotta put the weights on. So if you strategically decide if you're gonna do one side at one time, the one side at another time, both sides at the same time to give yourself a longer break. Whatever you have to do with weight changes, again, those decisions should be made to maximize your time. And what I saw is some people that didn't do that, they still were resting on the box jumps, for yeah. example. So like I saw some people go 10 fast and they would stand on the box in their 11th rep and still rest, when in reality they could have gone back and changed the weight quickly. Yeah, and then the last is just dynamic strategy or thinking on your feet when your plan breaks down. So famous quote, Mike 
Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. The um, Metcon's punching you in the face. <laughs> yeah. And if you go into it thinking, all right, I'm gonna do fives at the last barbell, and you only do three, then you need to figure out how to do the math really quickly to say, okay, I got this many reps to do, how do I break it up into what sets, and how do I minimize my rest time to be able to get through this last bar quickly? And one way that you can do that is kind of dictating your breaks based on the movement speed, the, the contra contraction speed you have coming out of the hole yep. or on the shoulder overhead. Yeah. That's something that people could play So with. once it slows down, that's when you take your break as opposed to thinking, I'm gonna, I'm go gonna to get it. to this number. Right, for sure. So now we're gonna do the demo with Clay. We're gonna talk over it and we'll have some fun. And we're off. And we have begun. <laughs> I'm really upset that I'm in the frame here the whole, yes. the whole time. That's I what like, I was I looking really, forward yeah, to, Max. I didn't want to be in there. <laughs> All right, so Clay, I think you'll see what we talked about, about pacing. This whole group went out pretty aggressively in round one. Um, but I think it, I mean, I really do think it's necessary. It's just... Yes. For the audience, much. real quick, uh, give a frame of reference on like where Clay is as, a, as an athlete. Uh, so he went into, he did the fittest experience. He was yep. in the, like there was the pro division and then RX the next division. one down, he was in the RX division. Um, he's pretty elite at body weight based stuff. Uh, and then the weights are, you know, that's definitely where his major priority in training is. But I'd say that he's, you know, uh, not quite a bubble athlete in the old regional format, but yeah. somewhere in the top couple hundred of a regional, yes. uh, depending on what the open type workouts are. He's definitely improved a lot. It's been fun to watch him and, and obviously Mike works with him and kind of see their, their relationship and then his development because he's on site quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So this was definitely the worst part of the workout for me, the front squats. And not at 135, but yeah. as it went on, um, the combination of going from jumping into, or from squatting into jumping was tough. So Clay, obviously, he's going down with the, the step down. You see some people in the background trying to do a rebound. I mean, I think that the best in the sport, you're going to see them probably rebound it and be efficient at that. That's just yeah. kind of natural selection of getting yeah. the, the best move a little bit better. Rebounding is going to be faster here. But for most people, I, I think it's probably a good idea to step these down just because yeah. they blow up so fast. Yeah, I actually thought there would be more separation in the box jumps. But after watching the workout, I mean, there still would be separation of people bounding versus not bounding if you could bound and not blow up like Mitch definitely has great bounding mechanics you see him on the right side of the screen uh, right behind Clay but it wasn't like a, the major thing that separated right. the workout. Well, what happened was it, it did maybe in the first couple rounds, but then the, everyone slowed down on the third bar and the fourth bar, so the, the box jumps didn't matter as much. Now, if you're talking about the elite level males and females at the games, something to work out like this came out, then that matters a lot more and yeah. the transitions. Yeah, I mean, every detail at that level matters yes. and they're good at every Everything. aspect of the exactly. game. Um, but for most people doing the workout, you have things that are exposing you. So for me in this workout, like my longer range endurance is gonna expose me, my front squat positions, repeated jumping. So you have to figure out with those limitations that you have that you're working on in training, how do you maximize your score? Yeah. Um, for Clay, um, I don't know, did you talk to him about his strategy, or Mike, uh, Mike, who, Mike coaches Clay about what his strategy was in the workout? I didn't talk to him about it, but one of the, you know I, I watched him. I had a couple other athletes going this heat, but I was you know I knew he was the one that was demoing, so I wanted to kind of get a feel for where he was at. One of the things that we talked about before was weight changes, and you'll notice there he took you know about 40 seconds uh, before he started his shoulder overhead, which I think is just way too long. And part of that is you have to with the weight changes, but if he would have done half of that or both sides during his box jumps, probably would have been a little bit more efficient and allowed him to get on it. But his biggest limiter in this is the shoulder overhead, as we'll see. Yeah, when I talked to Mike, he said that uh, Clay was having trouble a little bit with like the, the the lockout. It seemed like the hip drive and the show and the like the pressing musculature is okay, but just locking the bar overhead. I know that if those efficiency like really tiny nuanced aspects of movement really do play a pretty big role in just uh, allowing somebody to continue to work when they're getting close to failure. If your lockout starts to go at 205, I know I got caught with one that was like half locked out and I had to press it out and the extra energy it takes to try to stabilize overhead with bent arms is just like, kind of breaks you psychologically too. Yeah. I mean, this is something I've been saying forever, but movement economy is, it really is, the, especially as you get better, like have a better engine or better capacity, is the most important thing in the sport. Like yeah. find, if you have a perfect overhead position, those are so much easier. And so, you know, you obviously have a pretty decent overhead position that it allows it to be easier. It's just now building up your capacity, whereas yeah. Clegg probably has the capacity to do it, but he's got to clean up his overhead position. Yeah, his squat speed here looks pretty good. I don't know if he had that planned break. Um, 
and why he decided to take that rest break there, but his movement speed still looks pretty good at this barbell. Uh, he said when I talked to him afterwards that he probably would have been able to drop the hammer better if the peak weight was somewhere around 175 or 185, but the third weight being 175 and then the last one being 205, that's what really like put the brakes on his capacity, and I'm sure we'll see that as we get to that portion of the workout. Yeah. I'm just taking long breaks in the back. <laughs> uh, when I went into this workout, my back's still a little bit sketchy from uh, a little tweak I had a couple weeks ago. My major goal was just to do big sets and get out of it healthy. And I, I mean, I still wanted to beat Clay. I tried. You guys were close at yeah, the end. Yeah, I know. Well, everyone will see here yeah, shortly. Well, <laughs> I end up taking a little bit of time away from him uh, on that last shoulder to overhead bar at 205. Yeah. But this part, I mean, even the front squats at this weight, I mean, if you have inefficient positions, this definitely like, if I have a one CrossFit movement pattern that's really like limited by just positions, it's definitely front squat, like crunches my upper body forward, and puts me in a position where I can't breathe. It's not necessarily the strength, it's just positionally, like it's just so uncomfortable. And then that just causes like, you to be a little bit more disappointed and frustrated while you're going. You can't do as big a sets. So it's definitely something that I got to work on. And this combination of pairing of jumping to squatting shoulder to overhead is just, it's pretty stressful. What was the best part for you, Brandon? There was no best part for me, but I can grind still. So <laughs> that allows me to. Nah, Did you, I mean, you, you got the best a, score today, right? It would not be a good score if Let's say Travis was doing this, for example. Yeah, Travis, Travis is deloading this week or this weekend on Friday and Saturday because oh, Clay went back yeah. to the bot, the bound here. So I was going to actually say with, with him, you, he decided to change Switches his weights back and forth. Huh? Yeah, I actually think that's a smart move. I, yeah. I try to rebound some just because I knew it was going to be faster, but my knee just my, my yeah. left knee doesn't, especially when I'm coming down that side, doesn't want to cooperate with yeah. that. But obviously it's faster so maybe you know one of the strategies i had one of my athletes do that is better at rebounding was 10 really fast rebounds and then five where he's stepping down and then yeah. finish five fast yeah. just to keep his heart rate under control and, and again that's part of being an intuitive athlete of like maybe it's only eight maybe it's 12 rebounds before i slow down but finding those things and and that's something that you can do in your training too like i give athletes emoms or sets of things and, and tell them like find efficient ways to do it and then report back so that we can add that into some of the tests that you do and see if it actually works in like the chaotic test that we may run on a Saturday. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually reading a book right now about movement and they bring up a concept of dexterity and basically it's a subconscious process. Like when you're running, your brain's going through all these calculations if you're running on uneven terrain about where to place your foot, how to adjust things, then that's not something that's necessarily a consciously trained thing, but the best athletes in the world have this ability to have what they call dexterity dexterity, not necessarily coordination, but adaptation in chaotic situations. And I think in a CrossFit setting, that is just having movement variability. Like you start to get red lines, something blows up. How do you keep moving while getting your heart rate back yeah. down so that you can start going faster again, as opposed to like a negative spiral of work as you're just getting more and more tired. You have these ways of like redlining, coming off the red line and then getting back up to a fast work cadence. What's the book? Uh, I can pull it up on my phone. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Is it an audio book? No, it's a okay. Kindle. Hey, what's wrong with audio books? No, no, no. Yeah. He, I, the I, guy's name. I have a beef with people who say, I just read I this read book. I read a book, but I listen to it. No, no, no. You, yeah, you listen okay, to a no, book. No, no. I, I read them. The guy's name is Todd Hargrove, but I don't remember the name of the book. I Most of my book reading is listening now. Yeah, yeah just say listening. Dude, I was <laughs> I hate these people who's like, yeah, I just read so and so. Man, so. No, and, in college, I was like put on my resume. One of my was one of the things about me was that I really liked reading. And I got somebody was like, "What are you reading right now?" And just being put on the spot, I panicked oh, and I man. couldn't remember a single book that I read. And I'd read like six in the past month, and I was like, "Uh." uh. Uh, uh, that was like the worst experience ever. That's what I just felt like. I'm like, yeah. just call he me out. out. Yeah. He actually didn't read the book. Yeah. What is it? What I don't even read. That? <laughs> I've had that happen before. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, actually, someone asked me what Clay's name was, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like Clay, Clay, Clay. It's actually Clarence Edward Godfrey the Fourth, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. 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 All right. So back he's, to the workout. <laughs> he is now in round three. Yeah. So this is the one seventy-five bar, right? Yes. 
So this is kind of what we talked about before um, when we were at the desk. It, it, for most people, this is where they really started to slow down. So when we look at a 22 minute cap and we want to maximize our time, most people can handle the first and second bar relatively well, and then they get to the third bar no matter what, and it just, it was heavy. Yeah. So one of the things we suggested was, hey, it probably would be wise to go a little bit faster than you're comfortable with. It's obviously, kind of like minus two or minus three reps, so yeah. you're not redlining. Uh, and then pace out the third bar so that you can push yourself on the last one. Yeah. I think Clay did a pretty good job of that. His shoulder overhead, even at 155, was a little bit slow. I think, again, that's a, a lockout thing. Yeah. But he's cycling that front squat pretty quickly yeah. there. His squatting I mean, positions are really good, too. Yeah. Yeah, when, his, when the workouts change so frequently, you're not doing the same stuff all the time, how do you find your red line and know? Is it just something intuitive after pushing past it so many times? Yeah, yeah, but so that's the thing that we talked about last week too of like, and I've become a big believer in this, is training the patterns. Like the patterns don't, don't change. Like there's, there are really kind of four, uh, there are more than this, but four main patterns of sport. There's a flexion pattern, which is all no, the squats. No, but like if I mix like pull-ups and like a thruster, I'm way more tired than if I'd mix. Yeah. I think it is just experience and your threshold kind of changes. So you go through like the point of failure so many times and then you get back into it, you can start to sense when you're going to fail earlier. Do you think it's a good idea to like purposely go red line for a while so you have like a, uh, a, a yeah. indication I mean, of where you're gonna be? I don't know if it's necessarily purposefully redlining, but you do have to play the game. So we talk about pacing. Rather than being like a weenie about it and never getting yeah. it. I generally say if you're practicing to get better at competing, when you're doing your competition-based training, you should be a little bit on the conservative end in the front side of the workout and drop the hammer at the end. But when you're training, just be aggressive. Like get to the point of failure and see what your limits are because if you don't ever feel your limits, then you never like condition the ability to know right. when you're actually failing versus when you're just too uncomfortable to continue to stay coordinated. And the thing is, again, like going back to the patterns, all of our athletes are training those things, so the movement may change. It may be a front squat one re week and a squat clean the next week, and yes, those are a little bit different, but we know like that's a flexion pattern, and it, maybe it's muscle-ups one week and then chest bars the next week. Those patterns are the exact same, so we know where the limits are for them, and then obviously experience. You just know like, hey, this is my threshold, and I'm yeah. going to train that. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why volume tolerance and getting and being efficient with movement is so important because you can practice more. I only have, you know, probably two to three Metcons per week that I can tolerate, like just the intensity and the stress of those sessions. If I go at, you know, start to add more of that, my intensity just drops. Like my body just doesn't have the ability to do that. But then prescribing for somebody like Travis, like, you know, he could do three Metcons a day and still bring the intensity. And then if he does that for a couple of weeks, he'll, it'll start to drop. So being efficient, getting practice, doing it for years at a time. Was Travis always efficient? Uh, I think he's still not like the most efficient athlete. I mean, did he have some level, like, big holes yeah, that have been I, fixed? Yeah, they, his overhead position used to be like, his overhead position, his snatch used yeah. to be like I mean, really, really, really inefficient relative to the field. I'd say th three years ago when you guys were really working on it, I, it, was, it was really bad compared to the best in the sport and he like made uh, he dedicated a lot. I think we should go yeah. back and like yeah. film that. Yeah. Like say like, yeah. this is what it takes. Well, this is what his training question. program yeah. what, what he dedicated right? so much time. Yeah. I mean, hours. I mean, hours it of was incredible every day. And people don't see, people, sorry to cut you off, but I think this is really important that people know this because we have athletes that say like, why am I not getting better? People don't realize how much time he puts in or like a Fraser puts in or Noah puts in to, yeah. to be where they're at. I mean, it's just, it's a, it is a full-time job and it's a lot of dedication. Yeah, and if you're not good at something, you gotta do a lot of it. I mean, he snatched five days a week. He didn't snatch heavy to a max five days a week, but he did some sort of positional work five days a week. And some people in CrossFit are like, oh, it's distributing too much volume, but the best weightlifters, like Matt Frazier at some point in his life was probably on a split where he was potentially lifting heavy in the Olympic lifts in the morning and the evening of multiple sessions. You just get so much exposure to the actual movement pattern and your body in, oh, is this 205? This is 205. Your body basically just compensates to that stress to the point where it becomes more efficient. Yeah. Um, so this is actually interesting because so you're you're still on your box jumps and this yeah. is kind of you you end up catching him but this is what this is the difference in like being able to handle those last loads I mean Clay I think did a pretty good job for where he's at but then he got to this bar and you can see the brakes are a little bit longer he's only doing sets of you know four or yeah, five yeah I think what did he open with did he open with a four uh, it was four to five uh, I didn't yeah. count the reps but you know some of the some of the other guys that were in either the heat 
after the or before this or some of the guys that went after were able to do bigger sets on this heavier bar and that's where they could catch up yeah so he had a good splits in his first two rounds but you can see how hard the lockout is already yeah and I just sat down after that box jump set because yeah, like I got to get ready. For well, this. I just didn't want to like rush into it and do twos and do threes and waste energy. I was like, well, for me specifically, it just felt like it made the most sense to get my heart rate as low as I could get it and then just try to chip away in as few sets as possible. Yeah. I wanted to do it in two. Um, but then when I got into actually trying to move the barbell, it didn't necessarily feel like my, my shoulders were going to go, but my midline and yeah. just breathing and bracing was just it was like at the point of failure getting to seven. So I think I stopped it. I think I did seven, seven, six. And he was, I mean, how long has it been? Probably over a minute, minute and a half. And you know, you can make up a ton of time in this fourth barbell. Yeah. Like we talked about, like this is really where you kind of, you know, try to empty the tank. And you can also, I mean, it's lined up pretty well right now that you could actually see the cycle speed difference. So even though I'm doing seven, um, my time under tension for him having done three with a fail was probably about the same. Yep. So the speed of the reps matters a lot too because you're only working, if you're working in a you know 15 second burst and you're getting seven reps, that's better than working in a 15 second burst and getting three. Yep. So the speed of the reps matters and then the rest time. Um, Part of that is that as soon as you get into the catch position, there is no bobble, yeah. at least not on that first set. And so yeah. you were able to stand right up and then you're just use the rebound yeah, yeah, yeah for sure i do like and you guys probably noticed that in the the last set he did a split jerk to end yeah. i like his ability to kind of think on his feet there and say hey i may not be able to do a push jerk so because of that bobble and yeah. his position so i'm gonna do a split jerk because i know i can catch an extra one here and quite a few people did it yeah I, Allie I really, did that yeah um she was the best scorer until cal yeah until cal beat came it. along yeah but Allie, I mean, she's gotten so much better at um, both shoulder overhead and her front, her squatting endurance has really yeah. improved. But it was nice to see her, like she was close to failure. She has had another hard training week and she said her back was a little blown up. So she, when she was doing her push jerks on her second set, she basically was almost failing. Yeah. But she came back down and she ended up doing two more split jerks and they looked really crisp. And then she just ended up doing split jerks on uh, the next couple sets to finish. Yeah, Noah actually has that variability too in the clean and jerk. Uh, gauntlet from the games last year when he walked around the barbell, he actually split jerked his Thanks reps. Thanks for bringing that up again. I, had to, yeah. <laughs> I can't give him credit for that uh, dumb mistake. Uh, but the his chalk bucket, man. <laughs> oh man, that his, hurt. Yeah, his split jerk speed is actually faster than most yeah, people's push jerk. He can like the way split, he catches it and dips yeah, too is, and then, is very fast. So it it is definitely a skill that I think people should cultivate. If like you're, you see Clay, like he gets overextended there to try to stabilize. It's just not really a super stable position to be in overhead. But when you split jerk, it takes some of the demand away from that position yep. and kind of helps you get a more stable platform to press against than when your feet are parallel to one another. So it's something that people should probably play with and maybe can be one of the technical things people work on if they're watching this on Thursday and you're doing it on Saturday. Friday, just practice doing split jerks where you reset your feet pretty quickly. Um, is he done with his push jerks? We are about to find out. Yeah. That face so, you just made was dude, awesome. Dude, I was... You're like, oh, man. Yeah, I was in a hurt. And it was also so hot. Like, it was just, hot today. Just, and that makes your heart rate go even, like, higher. You're just like, oh, God. Y'all watching Stranger Things? Yeah. Season three? Yeah, I'm two episodes in. I heard that it gets better as you go. But I... I've That's what they tell it. you so you continue to watch. Yeah, they just keep you yeah. they keep you hooked. Oh no, the third yeah. third episode's better. Oh, I don't know. I think Clay got a bad rep there. She talked to his judge. Man, I didn't realize that it chewed him up this yeah. much. If I had seen that, I probably would have gave me a little bit more motivation to beat him. So this is one of the things too I think people can learn from. I, I just don't think you want to go to failure. And I know that he was trying to finish yeah. and beat you, but yeah. when you feel and yourself. He had the camera on, yeah, so he had, yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, look, I get it. I, I've been there plenty of times, but this is something that we can learn from and that that ends up taking much more out of you and it's a longer rest break before you get back on the bar. That's a Do much you think if he yeah. had dropped it, we would have said the other thing, though? Like, oh, man, you should have just squeezed it out. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, so now, now we know that was his last rep that he actually missed. Yeah. And he, so I get that. Um, 
But it also, one of the things that I made sure I did every round was look at you over there. Damn it, Chris. <laughs> my, I talked to Travis about his resting I posture. Yeah. I just basically- Travis, stop slouching. Yeah, I, went to, I went to sleep in the workout. <laughs> Are you done? Is the workout over? No, I'm just laying down. You're not on the, the box, worst. Baby. Cannon over there. I thought he was done like six times. I'm like, nice job, man. Fifteen minutes. Oh wait. <laughs> he took his belt off. I think he took his shoes off at yeah. one point. <laughs> My feet did start cramping in the workout, but it just kind of went away at some point. I didn't count how many Clay did there, but he was actually moving that 205 pretty well. He's definitely a much more efficient squatter at this weight than he yeah, is shoulder for overhead. Sure. In all of his rounds, even the 135, the, the squatting looked much more efficient than the shoulder overhead. Yeah. It's a good thing to look at, and then obviously something that he and Mike can talk about and say, hey, this is a, this is a big limitation for me compared to where I'm at with the squatting. I mean, those yeah. are fast. That's, 205 yeah. at the end of this workout was heavy. Yeah, he talked about having, having the ability to kind of bounce out of the hole here, um, which definitely, makes a big difference. My big bald head just came back in the frame. <laughs> yeah, I did three sets of five. I think he did three sets also, because yep. I know we got there pretty close to the same time, and then we got to the box. Well, you'll see it. I'm not gonna spoiler. We got Brandy People's on the bike. Pleasure. Oh yeah. Just wanted to give yeah. her a shout out. Yeah, Sorry. she was cheering me on. She's like, come on, Max, one more set. I'm like, I know. When I'm people just, say that, like, I guess Brandy's one of those people that, yeah, you, that yeah. does Because you know she but, holds herself that yeah, accountable. Yeah. So but other people, you're probably like, just yeah. shut up. I'm like, I want to <laughs> see you do this workout before you're yelling at me to go faster. All right, so this is his last set of front squats. I think you're on your last set. Yeah, two, you can right? kind of yeah. see the edge of my barbell going up. I think I've done three. I did five, 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 so this will be like four, and then I, got, I think I got one more. Yeah, and then I noticed I got to the box and I saw him go over and I was like, I can't rebound 20 reps right now. <laughs> was it your quads or just like? I was like just everything. Like I was dizzy, up. quads, heart rate. Yeah. Um, my plan was to try to do this. If I got there faster was to do this um, until he got to the box and then try to rebound to yeah. finish. But when we got there at the same time, you just I mean, I don't, maybe that's just soft of me that I kind of gave up, but I almost like fell on the box. I was just, my coordination at that point was just gone. And I didn't think I had the ability to rebound. And oh, look at that. He, he was did uncomfortable. Though. Yeah, he did. I like how, I mean, that's the way you got to finish yeah, a workout like he, that. If you have the rebounding capacity or ability. Yeah. Yeah, I like how it seems like everybody who drops the hammer with good rebounding ends up take, wanting their shoes off almost immediately yeah. from foot cramping. I wonder if it's just like the tension in the foot from absorbing all that force or what it is, but it seems like a pretty common theme. Yeah, I couldn't do it, so I don't, yeah, know. I don't, I don't know how that feels. I don't have that. Is that the end of the workout? The end, so that's the who, end. who wrote this Satan workout? Mia. Oh. Get her on camera. <clears throat> All right, so you just watched Clay do the workout. His time was 21.11. He just beat the time cap by about 50 seconds. The score profile from our training group went from Brandon at 16.30 all the way down to 177 reps. The female side, we had Allie finish in 14.45 all the way down to 184 reps. We think that on the female side and the male side that you probably could get down into the sub 12 range for somebody that can cycle that last barbell at really fast pace and still do all the box jumps bounding and unbroken. But this should give you a little bit of context to be able to say, you know, do, is there somebody on this list that I can chase? Are there any scores that make sense relative to what my capabilities are? And hopefully you can use that to put your best effort out. Nice. I mean, you know what? I was really Men's proud that health. you knew what a hole in one was. He thought I was making a sexual joke. No, 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 because, no, 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 I'm like, there's no hole in ones right now. George's nine months pregnant, there is no sex going on. This fool, he comes up to me, he goes, I got a hole in one the other day. And I kind of like looked at him like, damn, that's awesome. And he goes, you know what a hole in one is, right? And I was like, oh, I guess he meant something different than the golf. I was like, who who, who doesn't know what a hole in one is? Oh, I'm catching a cramp in my back. So breaking news alert, Cal did this after we filmed the scores and she got 1308. Cool. Yeah, she's Which a was freaking two minutes monster. We're, we're rolling, by the way. Go oh, ahead. she's very strong. Yeah, yeah <laughs> she's she probably stronger would, than both yeah, of us. She would have beat me if she used male weights. Yeah. Look, one of the things that we're trying to do with these these workouts in the videos is help you maximize the score on the day of, right? But the reality is, especially with workouts, as the weight ascends and it gets pretty heavy, you got to start thinking about your long term development and and look at these workouts and the ones that you're not doing well on. 
and ask yourself how you need to get better and what you need to get better at. Yeah, so we can help obviously with our online group training program, the design or one-on-one -on -one coaching, but make sure you're just thinking about how to get better long-term and not just maximizing your scores on these workouts because if you do want to be an athlete in the sport, you're going to need to develop longer term with all the skills so that you could race more effectively. Or you can go over to ddpyoga.com and get a free seven day yeah, trial. Yeah. Yep, that's always a yep. good option if you need to be more flexible and inspired. <laughs> do that and then do this workout. Have fun, guys. It's a wrap, you know what I'm saying? Your boy Project Pata in this thing, man. Hey, look, man, thank y'all for watching Train Think Tank YouTube channel. Y'all hit that motherfucking subscribe button, you know what I'm saying? So y'all go ahead, man. Thank y'all for watching the channel, you know what I'm saying? Hit that motherfucking subscribe button. Let it be known what it be known what it be known, you know what I'm saying? Pata.